It's important to remember, we talked about in bronchiolitis, uh, young infants are very, you know, they're obligate nose breathers. Um, and so that can cause all sorts of problems, right? They can get sort of obstruction. Um, and a little bit of resp increased respiratory effort can cause all sorts of problems. Uh, babies come in for respiratory problems. Parents come in and say, oh, my baby's breathing weird. And it's important to know, we need to know what's normal and what's not normal. And periodic breathing is very common. So newborn infants can have, um, you know, really, um, you know, the first two to four weeks of life is when we see it the most, something called periodic breathing. And and basically you have these episodes, you know, they're not totally myelinated. Their brain stems aren't to fully functional yet. And they'll breathe, it'll go, <sighs> And then they'll stop and they'll have these periods of pauses for, it's usually five to 10 seconds, but it can be up to 15 uh, um, uh, seconds where they have these pauses where they're not breathing. Now, if it's not associated with color change or tone and they're otherwise fine, that's periodic breathing. Now, if these episodes are lasting longer, if it's 20 seconds, or if they have you know change in color, change in tone or bradycardia, that's very concerning. That's not normal periodic breathing. That's important to know. We've already said that 95% of cardiac arrest in kids are associated with respiratory etiology. So, um, you know, bradycardia in kids, it's, it's, it's not heart block usually. It's usually secondary to hypoxia. That's important to know. If you have a high respiratory rate or grunting, that warrants um, consideration. This is more severe disease, right? Concern of respiratory distress. Fever in kids um, with a, a urinary tract infection, that sort of by definition indicates pyelonephritis. Uh, some of them will have bacteremia, but treatment does not change with bacteremia. Kids actually can clear urine infections pretty well. The incidence of bacteremia or sepsis in a well appearing febrile child is about two to three. Uh, um, percent. Now, we have really moved, uh, um, the AAP guidelines um, have, have moved us. We're really treating kids two months and under different um, than the two months and above. Um, the statistics are three months uh, of age and older, but our treatment guidelines are based on, on two years of age. Um, but immunized kids, um, if they are well appearing and have bacteremia, they're um, bacteremia rate is, is less than 1%. Meningitis in kids and febrile infants less than three months of age. Again, AAP is, is, is saying two months. Um, the incidence is about 1%. 1 um, so that is, is what we care about. We don't want to miss it. Um, and we will talk uh, uh, at great lengths um, on the management of, of fever. Uh, we have other resources that I'll tell you about in a couple slides. Okay, so febrile young kids, we treat kids differently. I don't care how they look. If they are a neonate and they're febrile, they are at risk for all sorts of things and they can't really tell us they're sick. So it is best to treat them um, with a full septic workup and give them antibiotics and keep them in the hospital. The AAP um, reminds us that urinary tract infections are the most common bacterial infection in kids. And so we should really think about that in kids that have risk factors. So young girls, uncircumcised boys um, without in fever, higher fever that's been going on um, without a source. Circumcision is protective against UTI. So AAP says actually now if you have circumcised infant, you do not need to do urine um, testing. It's very unlikely unless you have some anatomic issue. It's very unlikely that it's related to a urinary tract infection. Remember to treat uh, kids with analgesics. Otitis media is very uncomfortable. So give them oral or even topical analgesics. Uh, that's important in the treatment of otitis. And otitis can be self-limited. Often many of the cases are associated with viral infections and even bad, ugly, bacterial looking um, uh, otitis can resolve. So watch and wait treatment is recommended. Um, it's the first line, especially if the kid is over six months and it's um, unilateral. Um, 
then uh, you can you can watch watch and wait. If you have bilateral otitis in those sort of in the six months to two years of age, that's an indication to go ahead and treat with antibiotics. And how do we treat? We treat with high dose amoxicillin, so the 80 to 90 milligrams per kilogram per day. And um, you know, treat if they sort of fall out, if they're under six months, if it's bilateral, if they've got severe pain, if symptoms have been going on for a while. Aspirated foreign bodies are a concern when we see kids. Um, and uh, you know, x-rays, beware of the um, pitfalls of uh, aspirated foreign bodies and performing an x-ray. Unfortunately, it's helpful if you can see that radiolucent, um, radiopaque uh, foreign body, but most are radiolucent. I had a kid who played um, light bright with her brother and had a bunch of those little pieces in her mouth and her brother made her laugh and she aspirated and you could see it on her x-ray. That was great. We can confirm, yes, it's in there, but unfortunately, most most of the time we cannot see these things. And no matter what you do, that lateral decubitus, inspiratory, expiratory, um, those aren't totally helpful. So if you clinically suspect, yes, this is an aspirated foreign body, um, you should do bronchoscopy. And you can have delayed uh, findings. I've had patients who have had recurrent right middle lobe, right lower lobe pneumonia um, from an aspirated foreign body that just the symptoms were there for, for months. Um, so be aware that that can happen. Always uh, think, okay, so croup is very common in kids that we see with triter, but al always just take a moment to consider, could this be something else? Could this be an aspirated foreign body? If you have a hemangioma on the body and it's in the beard distribution, someplace on the face, you can have hemangiomas. That's more likely to have hemangiomas on the larynx. So be aware of that. And constipation, ooh, we see so much constipation. Most of the time it's sort of functional, it's related to diet. We have a terrible diet, not drinking enough water, et cetera. But think about sort of the pitfalls. Is this abnormal constipation? Um, so if they have early infancy constipation, that's not, that's not normal. Delayed passage of uh, um, meconium, if they've got some abnormal rectal exam. Um, it could be, you know, a, a, a patient that has had Constipation since infancy, uh, we have sort of partial or incomplete, less severe Hirschsprungs. There's many things that could happen or you can have sort of anatomic conditions. Kids with belly pain. Um, unfortunately, this is the veterinary medicine part of, of assessing uh, kids. Sometimes they say, oh, my belly hurts, but it's not really that. It may be a lower lobe pneumonia, maybe strep. Um, I've had patients who complain of belly pain and it's a testicular torsion. So think outside of that box and, and, and assess. And it's also true with, um, you know, a patient will present with knee pain when they have a skiffy, the problem is in their hip. So think about outside, um, you know, the, the other joints. Could this be a problem someplace else and keep that differential up? You can have, well, I mentioned this already, urinary tract infections in kids. They have a your, lower threshold um, to treat in those higher risk patients. And they can have a URI, um, but if the fever, let's say if they've had a URI for a day or two, um, and their fever is getting better, and then now they have a recurrent fever, or now they have vomiting. Think about UTI in those higher risk patients. And, you know, the nitrate testing may not be positive um, if it's a gram positive bacteria in, in that infection. Headaches are common in kids. The vast majority of headaches are really. Um, benign. Um, even most of them are, you know, primary headaches and even the secondary headaches are often due to some self-limited viral infection. Migraine infections are common in kids. Um, they tend to be sort of um, pretty sudden onset and pretty intense. Um, less commonly are they um, unilateral and that tends to be more common in adults. Usually, you will have the vast majority of serious causes. You'll have some clinical features, including neurologic symptoms. So I would heavily advise against imaging most um, patients uh, with, with headache. Treat them symptomatically.
both adolescents and younger kids. So I know younger kids shouldn't be drinking, but sometimes they do. Sometimes parents give alcohol in the bottle. Um, but hypoglycemia is a lot more common in both adolescents and younger kids. So if there is alcohol on board, think about hypoglycemia, look for it and treat it. Uh, remember that um, unfortunately, in head trauma, you have got softer, you know, thinner uh, craniums. Uh, these patients can have um, a lot of injury without bleed or abnormalities. You can have um, diff just diffuse cerebral edema, um, diffuse exonal injury that can cause problems. Concussion, concussion we'll talk about this uh, in trauma at great length, but Concussive symptoms are common in kids, and to avoid the second impact syndrome, these patients really should not be involved in sports until they're entirely asymptomatic and cleared by another physician in follow-up. Kids in metabolic crisis will have dehydration, metabolic uh, um, acidosis. These patients can present ulcer. They can present with uh, vomiting. Those patients, all of these patients with inborn errors of metabolism, you need to stop the problem. They either were um, exposed to something, they're breaking something down that's causing toxicity, um, or they have some issue that what they're eating is causing uh, um, toxicity. So you want to stop the catabolism. Uh, um, metabolism and catabolism. So make them NPO and then give them glucose and fluids. And then, you, you know, do, if you do those um, three things, um, then you can figure out what exactly to do, depending if, if this is a known diagnosis or not. You want to just stop the metabolic pathway and then give glucose and uh, fluids um, to prevent uh, a further breakdown. Kids can get hypoglycemic very quickly, so um, don't give insulin and glucose to them um, in the treatment of hyperglycemia. And when kids present with um, syncope, it's important to consider, or seizure, right? So I've had many kids that have presented with seizure that actually, when you investigate a little bit further, sounds like it was um, syncope. And um, vasovagal syncope is very, very common, so get a good history and physical um, exam. But remember, with syncope, you can have significant myoclonic jerks. Um, I have a couple of kids in my family that, uh, that are very easy, uh, pass out very easily. And it's interesting. I mean, their eyes have rolled back and they've had a few um, actual tonic clonic, clonic jerks. So be aware of this. Oh, is this a seizure or a syncope? Um, consider getting an EKG because you could make a diagnosis of brigadas or prolonged QT or some sort of abnormality. Always be concerned uh, with syncope if it occurs during exertion. Um, there's a lot of problems that, that could you could have underlying pathology associated with that. And ask, you know, recurrent uh, um, episodes, you want to get a good family history. Um, if it happens with exercise, um, if it happens where they are have prolonged spells uh, or chest pain associated with that, or, you know, any... Um, any other symptoms, be very concerned about that. I had a case once of this kid who was uh, eating Thanksgiving dinner with his uh, girlfriend's family, and he was sitting at the table, you know, eating, 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 and he had all of a sudden he had crushing chest pain. And he's like, oh my gosh, I think I'm gonna die. He was yelling very dramatic. He's like, I think I'm gonna die. I think I'm gonna die. I think I'm gonna die. And then he passed out. And, and of course, the whole table family came in, you know, after this event. And probably what had happened, I think, is that he had like a little esophageal, like food bolus that was causing pain. And then he vasovagaled and passed out. But like, how could I not admit that to the hospital, right? It was very dramatic. Um, but, you know, he, they didn't find anything on his observation, hospital admission. Um, but, you know, it's our job to think about, okay, what else could cause this? Um, so syncope can look a little tricky, may look like seizures. And benzos, uh, benzos can be a little bit unpredictable in kids. Um, they can cause disinhibition, can cause all sorts of problems. So we really do a lot of um, uh, Zyprexa or olanzapine is sort of our um, pediatric psychiatrist's uh, first line um, in treating uh, um, agitated patients. So remember that.